Okay. Welcome everyone. My name is David Chard. I'm the Dean of the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development at Boston University. And I wanna welcome you to uh, this webinar, a fourth in our new set of events focused on discussing recent uh, topical topics, events in uh, education, important topics with scholars and leaders here at BU and at BU Wheelock. Uh, we've had some fascinating conversations to date and I expect today will be no different. Um, topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart, um, the science of reading and how uh, how the national movement about around the reading science is playing out in teacher preparation. So um, we have a, a large number of people joining us and I'm very excited to, um, to uh, have this conversation. The focus of these, um, these webinars has been really on topics that are closely linked to our guide star. This is um, a mission, if you will, for our college. Um, we're dedicated to transforming systems, in this case, public education systems that impact learning and human development for a thriving, sustainable, and just future in Boston and beyond. I don't think it is too difficult to understand the connection between literacy and the ability to thrive in our society. So I won't spend a lot of time justifying that for you. Um, a couple of things about these webinars. We would ask that um, in the course of our conversation, if you have questions you'd like to ask of the panelists, that you um, put those questions in the Q&A. Um, I will try to monitor the Q&A, as will my colleagues who are on the webinar with us, and we will either answer them in type or I may raise them with the panelists as we're moving through our conversation. So um, that's very important. I also... Um, want to encourage you to also make comments in the Q&A if you want. We will follow up if we don't answer your questions in the course of our conversation today. We will follow up separately from this if you've identified yourself and we're able to um, able to find you. This webinar is being um, uh, streamed so to you. It'll also be part of our YouTube channel at BU Wheelock. So if you want to follow up there or want someone else to see the panel because you think it's so um, interesting or informative, then we would encourage you to point them to our YouTube channel um, to find this webinar and the preceding ones. So ah, now to the issue at hand and an introduction of today's speakers. Um, I wanna frame this topic um, about literacy and reading education a little bit. And this is a very hot topic. Many people are paying a great deal of attention and focus on the topic of early reading development. And of course, it's a critical topic. Um, parents and state policymakers across the country have been increasingly concerned about student reading proficiency and uh, their concern is justified. We know that success in early reading is a very strong predictor with a high degree of reliability about how students will do academically across their entire academic career. And the challenges have certainly got the attention of lawmakers and state leaders. Here in Massachusetts, for example, uh, Governor Healy has proposed a major transformation in reading instruction in our schools due to the alarming number of children who are not meeting grade level goals in early reading and also struggle later with uh, literacy as they get closer to graduation. And the um, performance on the MCAS, for example, has been very challenging for a lot of students. This is also a particularly personal topic for me. I've spent decades both doing research and technical assistance in this area, working with Reading First, um, now several, I hate to admit it, several decades ago, but, um, and, and still we struggle um, to implement strong uh, reading instruction for all children. And I wanna, um, uh, we're joined today by two experts in this area, two of my um, wonderful colleagues at BU Wheelock that I want to introduce you to. And we're gonna kind of get into this conversation about why this remains an important topic, why it remains challenging and what we're doing about it at BU Wheelock, both through our research and scholarship, as well as our, as well as our preparation of teachers. So um, first I'd like to introduce Dr. Kate Frankel. Um, who is Associate Professor of Literacy Education and Chair of the Language and Literacy Education Department at BU Wheelock. Uh, Kate teaches graduate courses in literacy and qualitative methods. Her research focuses on adolescent literacy. And Kate, or Dr. Frankel, um, is a former high school literacy teacher and currently works with the Boston Public Schools secondary teachers around the district's Equitable Literacy Initiative, which we're very excited about. 
I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Nancy J. Nelson, an assistant professor of special education at Boston University and deputy director of the National Center on, Impro on Improving Literacy and the Lead for Literacy Center. Dr. Nelson is a, a former special education teacher and school psychologist and a principal investigator on more than a dozen federally funded projects to develop or test interventions for students with or at risk for learning disabilities. Kate and Nancy, welcome. Really excited to have you both here. Um, and I'm going to jump right into our discussion and be sure to save uh, time toward the end of the webinar for the audience. And as appropriate, as I mentioned, we'll thread your questions into our discussion as we go. And I definitely uh, encourage you to uh, share your questions through the Q&A. So let me get started with um, this question. And uh, probably you're, you're both going to have thoughts about it, but how to best teach students to read has been a conversation that has gone on for decades. And I'm curious why this remains um, a hot topic and, and relatively unsettled. And uh, Nancy, why don't you take a shot at this? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think you, you you hit on it from the beginning, right? This is a critical area of student development. It's something that we know is very important for their education and for a host of, of outcomes they might experience. But we still don't know a lot, right? We know what, there are things that we know about how reading develops, about what we should do instructionally, but there's a lot we still have to learn. I would also say that in the context of education, this idea of using research evidence is relatively new. So it's only been the last 20 years or so that we've actually had a, a strong push for teachers in particular to be adopting what we call evidence-based practices in classrooms and applying those. So with that in mind, there's there's research that needs to be done and accrued to support that translation in particular of research to practice and support teachers to apply and use the research evidence we have available and new evidence as it's emerging. Um, another thing I would say is that we've historically worked in silos, right? Like I'm a special education researcher. I'm a special education teacher. I, I live in my special education program. Uh, but if I'm not collaborating with my general education colleagues, then we're not we're not bridging those divides. So I might be focused on phonics as an expert related to how those early reading skills develop. But I have colleagues who are experts in other areas. And if we don't have conversations and listen to one another to share our expertise, then we're going to continue to work in these silos and not make much progress or change practice because teachers are only hearing one side of the issue at a time. Kate, I'm sure you have thoughts about this too. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. Kate, jump in. Sure. I think um, so just adding on to what Nancy has said, I also think I think a lot about how reading and literacy more broadly is deeply personal to many of us, maybe all of us. Um, and I think that's because we use literacy to do things in the world. We use it to connect to other people um, and to connect to people who came before us um, through different practices that we might engage in with families or with religious communities. Um, and also, I think a lot about how literacy is so connected to who we are, um, who we want to become, and how we relate to others. And so I think a lot of that contributes to um, people's real passion for the topic and wanting to make sure we support all of our children in being able to do great things with literacy. I personally experienced great difficulty learning to read. Um, those early experiences shaped my whole life. I, that's, I've devoted my, now my life to this topic, um, first as a teacher of high school students who also experienced difficulty with reading, and now as a researcher who's really focused on understanding students' experiences of literacy instruction and sort of their perspectives on what literacy should look like. Yeah, Kate, you actually enter into this conversation a really important thing about the power of literacy. Right. And how the denial of literacy to people historically has been a way to keep people um, to really to de deny freedom from people. I, I don't think that's I um, think that's all important. That is important to all of us. Right. That part of whether you're working at the early stages or the later literacy stages, empowering young people to um, be literate is really our key goal. Let me ask you both, and Kate, maybe you'll you'll start here because I, I this is not a side issue. I want uh, I think we sometimes fall into this thing. Well, who are, am I a phonics person or am I a, whatever the other side is? Um, it's not about sides. There's really multiple multiple dimensions to the development of literacy. So I'd like to hear you both maybe construct for our audience what that 
those complex dimensions are in kind of a developmental way, knowing that different children need different things along those along that stage. But if you can help us understand the broader picture of literacy development, and Kate, I'll let you start here, and or maybe Nancy should start. You you tell me who who's best to begin that part of the conversation. Kate, go for it. I'm happy to, I'm happy to get us started, and Nancy, I know <laughs> we'll fill in where I where I um, where I miss things. Um, I think I appreciate that, David, and I think um, I hope that um, this, this conversation is a way to really push that the idea that we really, as as teachers, as as educators, as um, researchers, we really need to embrace the complexity of reading and literacy, and work collaboratively across our various historical silos that Nancy was talking about, both in K twelve and university education to move forward together. Um, and I and I and I uh, totally agree that sort of this idea of sides um, is incredibly unproductive um, for the work that we need to do to support students um, and teachers around reading. Um, I think we also need to acknowledge the good work that has been done previously, as well as where we want to grow. Um, that's part of part of our work, right? All of our work. Um, so just to like, just to kind of give you like a specific example of this. I don't know anyone in literacy education who would deny the importance of phonics in learning to read English. Um, of course, phonics is important. Um, so if we can take that false and I think extremely unproductive dichotomy of phonics versus no phonics off the table and instead work together to kind of like lean into these harder conversations about that complexity and all the different things that go into literacy and reading, motivation and engagement, identity, uh, vocabulary, comprehension, criticality, um, online comprehension, which is some of what some of our colleagues study. Um, that's the that's where that's the work of education. That's the work of our college of education. Um, and so I think the the collaborative work that we've done here at BU Wheelock that we're continuing to do here um, to have those harder conversations that span programs, departments, and areas of expertise. Um, that's what gives me hope um, for for kind of moving behind David. What you were saying, sort of this um, this idea of sides, or as we've famously called it, the reading wars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, war, war in general does not benefit anybody, right? Um, and this is a great example of that in a more ideal or idea focused area. But Nancy, what would you add to Kate's comments? Yeah, I mean, kind of going back to something I was saying a little, a little while ago, an unfortunate side effect of academia and being an expert in a particular area is that you're necessarily narrow, right? Teacher education programs can only be so large. They only have so much time to teach candidates to go out and teach students to read. And so necessarily those teacher education programs and the, the focus of those programs, certainly they're informed by you know, teacher preparation standards within a state and, and other guiding bodies, but they're really informed a lot by the experiences of the teacher educators themselves, right? And their expertise. And so it's really important that we're working across these silos and drawing on different areas of expertise to make sure that full picture what Kate outlined, but those other, you know, those early reading skills that no one's denying the importance of are part of that training and and um, in ways where we're drawing on the research evidence we have available to support practices. So we know that kids in the early grades really need explicit phonics, phonemic awareness, these basic skills instruction in order to be able to grapple with these other areas of literacy that are so important, are much more difficult to teach, truly and should be the vast majority of their literacy sort of experiences in schools because we can we can we know how to teach these early skills and do it effectively early on and we should be able to do that and move on to these other areas and not have to focus so much on those those basic skills um, particularly as students are approaching later elementary school and beyond so I want to press you both a little bit about. Um, so now I've got we've got this developmental picture um, of you know early skill development and then the complexities of literacy. Um, it, it is possible, however, for an older child to also be experiencing challenges with some of those fundamental skills, right? If they have, for example, a learning disability or something that's making it more difficult for them, or perhaps is taking longer for them to develop those skills. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, we, we we know that there are kids that are going to struggle with those skills across the lifespan, right? And there are, there are strategies and approaches that we can put into place to at least lessen that that struggle. Um, it, that, that does require focus on, on these skills longer, but I think an unfortunate reality right now is there are more kids struggling 
or longer with those skills than we need to have struggling um, for, you know, probably a, a host of reasons. Yeah. And I also want to point out, um, sorry, I'm editorializing. I apologize. No, great. <laughs> but I also want to point out that you can be struggling with reading and also being benefiting from the kind of dimensions that we were talking about about what literacy offers you, even if you're not fully independent as a reader to begin with. And one of the questions in the Q&A is about librarians and their role in this. And Kate, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the power of the librarian in children's literacy development or young people's literacy development. Sure. I mean, I think that there, there are so many different, as we were saying before, there's so many different dimensions of literacy, right? And so by talking about all those different dimensions, we're not mitigating mitigating um, sort of those those foundational skills, um, but also children, young people, adults, all of us also often use reading and literacy as a way to learn about ourselves, find joy. Um, not everybody. I, I happen to have someone in my family who would say he doesn't love that part of it. Um, but I think um, really thinking about ways of engaging, of engaging students in story and a librarian's are incredibly important for that um and 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 making those connections and and finding ways of of um engaging with text in really complicated ways too not just we think about reading as reading text but there are lots of different ways to read um and and thinking about that i think is is hugely important to this conversation yeah so I'm particularly uh, editorializing again. I'm particularly proud of um, Kate and Nancy and the their colleagues who have um, gone at this as colleagues um, in a serious way to look at our current teacher preparation programs to identify areas where there are gaps and to remedy those. And there's a question in the Q and A about where does pre-service teacher preparation how does pre-service teacher preparation address the research evidence? And how do you, how have you, like, why don't we just use BU Wheelock as, as the example, since it's what we all know best. How have you gone about this? Like, what, what are you doing to try to make sure that the teachers we're preparing are as, as well prepared as we can um, help them to be before they go into classrooms? So maybe I can just jump in um, as, as, as you know, David and Nancy, we've all been really thinking a lot about this together, and so I can get us started. And then, um, so we mentioned previously that our main focus really has been at BU Wheelock has been trying to collaborate more intentionally across programs to support our current and future teachers that are in our our classes, our undergrad and graduate classes. Um, one of the strengths is that our faculty bring a diversity of perspectives, different ways of thinking about literacy. This is a strength. Um, and it contributes directly to preparing our graduates to be knowledgeable, thoughtful, and I think critical teachers of reading. Um, so one simple thing we've done is created ongoing opportunities to engage in conversations as faculty across our various areas of expertise. Um, my colleague, Jen Bryson, also led an effort to develop a literacy framework to help guide and formalize the work across programs and departments. Um, and this has contributed to ongoing redesign of many of our programs in, at BU Wheelock. Um, Jen's also working to share the work with our university supervisors, school-based partners. Um, for example, they've been doing working groups focused on the Massachusetts New Early Literacy Guidelines and the related resources to support teachers in those areas. Um, and I'm going to just name a few other things, if that's okay, David, I know. Yep. Um, but there's so much going on. Um, my other colleagues in elementary and literacy education have um, recently revised our Introduction to Literacy course to explicitly engage conversations about the complexity of literacy and all the, the ways of thinking about literacy and the importance of all of these different aspects. Um, they've also written about some of their thinking in this area in a recent op-ed um, in EdWeek. And um, two other quick points, we're revising some of our programs now. Um, as a way to kind of like build from and learn from the expertise of faculty across programs and departments. So for example, um, students will be taking, in our reading ed program, we'll be taking courses in critical literacy with our colleague Davina Jackson and in literacy leadership with our colleague uh, Christina Dobbs. And finally, but not last, last but not least, certainly not least, um, colleagues in special education, including Nancy, um, have de developed a new course for students across programs that's designed to specifically focus on foundational skills to really prioritize that in light of these ongoing conversations and sort of um, our collaborations across the college. And I think Nancy can speak more to that um, that piece of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Kate. And thanks for sharing all those examples. I, I 
appreciate the, the conversations that we're having immensely because it does just really inform the, the ways that you can do this to accomplish this goal of really supporting education in this space. And so this methods course that, that uh, Kate referred to, the foundational skills course, will be a like a deep dive on foundational reading skills in everything related to literacy that we want students to be able to, to teach, but really focused on giving them applied opportunities to practice the, the evidence-based approaches that we want them to use to deliver instruction. So we want this linked to practice immediately through field experiences, drawing on the conceptual foundations that they will have learned through prior literacy coursework. We have a sequence that we've sort of laid out that supports the conceptual foundations, this application through, found, through actual methods skills instruction linked to field experiences and also coursework related to uh, teaching multilingual learners. So students will have, and students across all of our programs essentially will have those three courses as part of their training, which I I, I feel really great <laughs> about. Um, certainly this it's not a done deal, right? We're, these are conversations we're continuing to have. And as students are engaging in these courses, we probably will do additional sort of revisions, but um, we're, we're making some headway there. Yeah, uh, I, I also want to give people a sense of not just the teacher preparation work, although I, I just have to say how, um, as a dean, it's uh, amazing to watch the power of colleagues coming together to focus on transformation of programs with the chill, downstream impact of children in schools being the most important um, goal, like how, how do we prepare professionals who then are enabled? Someone asked about whether we teach specifically programs like Wharton Gillingham, and my response in the Q and A was no, we don't, we don't do that. But we, it, our goal is to make sure they have the tools, so that if they're going into a school or a school district where a certain program is being used that aligns with the science of reading at whatever developmental level they're prepared to teach it because they understand it. They understand those foundational skills and, and later skills that children need to learn. Um, so anyway, it, thank you both for what, you, what you're doing and what I know is going to be the benefit of all of the teachers who come through our program. However, I also wanna talk about what you're doing on your scholarship. So, um, because we also uh, know that we don't have all the answers and we wanna understand better how to more effectively lead literacy, more effectively work with children with different needs. Um, so I'd like you both to pick a project that you're currently focused on um, that is helping to kind of fulfill the, the quote unquote science of reading, right? Like the work that we're building, the knowledge we're building about literacy development and just give us a little detail about what that looks like. and. Uh, Nancy, you want to start with this one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there there are a couple, so it's a, it's hard to uh, <laughs> to narrow down. Um, but I one thing that I really want to hover on, I think, related to this idea of really making an impact and changing practice, is a national evaluation of multi tiered systems of supports that's um, being undertaken by the Institute of Education Sciences, which is the research arm of the U.S. Department of Education. And I'm leading one of the treatment arms of that um, very large study um, where we're using an instructional approach that is intended to work uh, in tandem with what schools have already adopted and are implementing, but to really enhance their practices so that they are better aligned with the science of reading. And so taking this sort of systems lens and working very closely to provide professional development that's you know job embedded, training on the ground, coaching, support on in an ongoing way, supporting school leaders to understand the, the necessity of focusing broadly on literacy um, and addressing these areas of support. This happens to be an early grades um, focused project, but I'm, I'm really excited about the um, what, we're, what we're seeing in terms of what support is required, the kinds of knowledge that, need, that teachers and uh, school leaders need to have, how we can push on uh, implementation to make those changes and support sustainability of that. I mean, that's something that we don't talk a lot about, I think, um, when we're thinking about changing practice, but it's it's certainly something that's essential because uh, without that sustainability, we're likely to not see the effects that we really, the impacts for students that we really wanna see. Yeah, that's a great illustration. Kate, tell us one of your projects and how it sort of, I, in some ways bookends, because I know you do adolescent literacy, it kind of bookends the work that Nancy and her colleagues are doing in early reading. 
Sure. It's Nancy. It's fun to hear about your projects. <laughs> Do more of this. Um, Yes, as I mentioned earlier, and as David as David just mentioned, I think a lot about older students, students in middle and high school, um, and so a lot of my work is trying to is is really trying to understand how they experience literacy instruction and um, particularly literacy intervention um, in middle and high school contexts. Um, what are they, you know, asking questions like what are they experiencing? What what is the, how do they experience the curriculum that they're in the instruction? Um, what are they noticing? Um, and then how can I how can we think together about supporting um, teachers and students' efforts in generative ways that both respect their knowledge and expertise and extend that um, based on what we know from ongoing research. Um, so in some of my recent work, I've collaborated with older students and their teachers to co-design and co-teach. Um, in ways that are responsive to students' critiques of the instruction they've experienced in school in the past. Um, and for a lot of students, their histories of, of reading instruction and the experiences they've had can be quite negative. And so really trying to reframe that and rethink what we're doing in those spaces um, in ways that really like honor who they are and um, their identities and their, um, their experiences and their, their brilliant ideas about um, about literacy, but also, as they will tell me, not just about reading, even though they know that's what I think about, but about re their relationships with others and how reading and literacy really supports those kinds of things, both in and beyond school. Um, and so for me, the work really focuses on um, on young people and, and their teachers and young people as teachers in their own right, um, who can teach us a lot um, about, about how we think about literacy. Yeah, you, you both bring up a topic around equity in some ways, right? Like the quality of teaching at the lower grades so that all children have access to the tools to be literate. And then at the upper grades, giving kids not just the opportunities to think about literacy as a tool, but also access to content that's motivational to them and to um, understanding how they can uh, kind of shape their own literacy learning. I think, uh, yeah, that's a really powerful sort of thing. There, there are a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A that are related to one another and are linked to this topic of, of equity and equitable practices. Um, one of the questions has to do with gateway communities. And I'm assuming the question is really about communities where we have higher rates of, um, of, um, uh, of, children having challenges in schools for a variety of reasons. Um, there's often a class factor here. There's off, also often um, a challenge for um, uh, keeping and, and supporting and retaining teachers in these communities. Um, and I also think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, in some cases it's related to language and um, first language versus second language. But I'm wondering if you if you could talk about how both this early reading development and later literacy development can impact these kinds of communities and how we think about helping teachers in these communities, either at the preparation level level or the in-service kind of level. I know that's a lot, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, anyone want to take a first shot at that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll jump in. I, I mean, I, I think everything that we're saying applies equally to these communities. So this issue, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I do a lot of work in early reading and I'm talking about, you know, phonics and foundational skills instruction. But the idea that that is um, culturally insensitive or not going to take into account identity or background is a, is a misconception, right? That's part of the work. And most of the work I've done actually has been in some of these communities that have been historically marginalized, working with students to develop their early literacy skills because I see literacy as a social justice issue. So I know this is something, David, you have written about with, uh, with colleagues of ours. And it's um, these things it, you know, can't be mutually exclusive. So we want to be doing the things that Kate is talking Talking about and the things that I'm talking about in concert in all of our communities, but it's really you know in my work most most important in the, these types of communities to make sure that um, that we are we're giving everyone that equal footing and equal shot at uh, all of the things we want for them in their lives. Yeah, Kate, do you want to add to that? Any, yeah, I think I think just a couple things. One, um, I think that the the like historic silos problem applies here too, right? Like literacy is inextricably linked to language multiple and, and thinking about literacies across languages and ways of using language um, for communication for, for all those things. Um, 
And, and I also just, uh, when I, you were reading that question, David, I was reminded of just like thinking about older students and um, students coming with different experiences. Um, and I just was reminded of like pa Paulo Freire, who was really famously said that reading is about reading the word as well as reading the world. And I think one of the things that um, if we can kind of keep at the forefront is wherever our, our students are in terms of reading, and I will say in English, because I think that oftentimes is what we're talking about because of all the pressures around standardized testing and all sorts of other things and I, um, um, histories of, of policies in Massachusetts, um, that doesn't mean they're not bringing all sorts of rich literacies um, you know, more broadly and, and understandings mm -hmm. of the world. And so being able to make those connections both to sort of like connect to amplify those things and also support them in in areas that that um that make sense like i think that's how, that's been a way for me to think about um to think less about what is lacking and more about what is and how that can be extended um in collaboration with students and i'm thinking mm -hmm. here particularly about older students but i think this applies equally to um students across the de developmental span yeah, yeah. I mean, I taught internationally for a number of years and in languages where students were both developing English literacy and spoken uh, uh, language in their mother tongue, but there was no liter there was there was no written um, uh, products for them to sit and read. That had not been developed yet. I think there's more of it today than there was in the 1980s when I was there, but. Their first language did not have a rich literature. It was not the Bible and a couple of other um, seminal pieces were available, but it's only now that there's more catch up, right, in, in literacy access um, in, in those other languages. Um, great examples. Thank, thank you um, both related to your, your research. I, I want to um, uh, go back to a, a kind of more of a in, a, in a few minutes we have left, and there are a couple of um, questions remaining in the um, in the chat that I'll try to, or to in the q and I'll also try to get to, but there's a, a lot of new evidence-based, um, uh, sort of adopted policies related to evidence-based reading instruction. And as, as I mentioned earlier, there's an initi initiative on the part of our governor in Massachusetts to transform um, kind of transform uh, what we're doing in teacher preparation, but also in instruction in schools. But I'm wondering what advice you would have for state leaders who are getting ready to, in, 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 we can be very specific to Massachusetts, but who are getting ready to think about how to use the funds that are being invested um, in helping to uh, improve literacy outcomes for all students. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are a number of things that that we can do, or we can try and to advocate for to support um, the the use of these funds for literacy development. I um, one thing that comes to my mind, particularly related to teacher preparation, recognizing that teacher preparation programs are necessarily short. We don't have the ability to train teachers deeply in all of the things that we want them to be trained in before they're going out into the field. So, how can states use the, this, these funds that they have available to enhance that training or to offer incentives for teachers to obtain additional training, whether it's, you know, salaries or, you know, uh, other types of support to allow them to further their education related to literacy as a way of building increased knowledge in the field. I, we know professional development initiatives that are one-off that, you know, they're not, um, extended or maybe when teachers don't have buy-in to participate, there are issues with that actually translating into changes into practice. So opportunities for teachers to willingly engage in um, additional professional development and training with some support that is ongoing would, I think, would do a lot to, to improve um, practice in these areas. I also tend to be someone who um, believes that we should have a little less local control related to some of these types of issues and do think it would be wise for states to provide um, more guidance about what, what schools should be doing related to literacy, not to mandate particular programs or a specific assessment or to um, sort of hand hog tie teachers from being able to implement effective practice but to really support them in that work to, to adhere to what is what is effective practice rather than um, 
utilizing resources maybe that we know are not not informed by the best best available research evidence. Kate, what would you um, add to that? Um, thanks, Nancy. I think um, what I've just seen um, sort of both locally and nationally is that we're spending a lot of time and we're focusing a lot of attention on sort of like the quote unquote right curriculum. Um, particularly as it relates to the teaching of phonics and foundational skills. And so my advice um, for what it's worth <laughs> to um, policymakers would be um, to really, to not lose sight of what we've been talking about, the complexity of literacy um, and all the different, the different elements that go into that and what go into the teaching of reading. Um, and I think this includes, and Nancy, I think you were speaking to this, this includes investing in the time and space for teachers to engage in collaborative learning um, that's responsive to their local context and their students and to and to um, Nancy's point, like to support that work, um, but to also be responsive to teachers' knowledge and expertise as well um, and their knowledge of their context. Um, I also think we need to pay a little more attention to the systems and structures that um, play a major role in how a curriculum or a program is taken up within a particular school or district. Um, we don't talk a lot about those things um, and how they can really um, like shape what happens on the ground. Um, and finally, I think you you all probably won't be surprised given what I've sp spoken to before, but I think we needed to take much more seriously the voices and perspectives of students um, and also their teachers. Um, so listening to what, stu what students have to say about their experiences and making adjustments to curriculum and instruction based on that. Um, I think oftentimes policy decisions are made based on sort of um, data that lends, that lends itself to more quantifiable outcomes. And of course that information is super important, um, but so too is some of that qualitative and process data that helps us to understand like how things are actually working for, for, um, for young people in, in schools um, and what we might wanna shift based on maybe some of that, those insights. Um, so I think ultimately we just need to get better at creating sustainable processes for continuing to work on this together. This is not something that, that's gonna sort of end with the perfect curriculum or the next you know the next product i think it's really something that we need to build in to engage in together over time and to have the com hard conversations that we've been talking about across these silos yeah there there are a couple of questions i think that are related to what you all are talking about one is that you know we often see uh scientifically based uh, reading instruction um, uh, reduced to a phonics versus no phonics kind of um, conversation. And I think you've both highlighted why that's problematic. But I do think that the question is, is how do scholars and teacher educators impact that conversation? Like, what should we be doing? I think one of the answers is we do these kinds of events, right? We have webinars where we invite people to come and hear what what the work is being done in schools and um, and the relationship between researchers and and uh, teachers and schools. Um, but other thoughts about that, like how do we get away from this dichotomy, which is a false one? Um, yeah, I think it's got to be elevating these conversations. I mean, so using where we have platforms, so this webinar being being one of those, but the National Center on Improving Literacy being another space where we can we can elevate the conversation, serving as an exemplar for other programs. We actually had a, a program from another state reach out to us about coming to visit to see what we were doing, to, to learn about sort of how we were revising our, our literacy preparation programs so that they could take that back to their state and enact it. And I think providing more opportunities for that or elevating that that, that is an option for, for folks is another way to think about how we can you know, get the word out about the fact that this, these aren't isolated conversations. I think the other thing I would say that's really important um, that it has becoming, I don't know, increasingly apparent to me is the idea that we need to listen more and ask more questions rather than making assumptions that we know what someone is talking about. So because I have expertise in a particular area, I necessarily talk about what I have expertise in, but that doesn't mean that I don't think the other things are important. And so certainly I have a responsibility to communicate that more effectively, right? But I, I also want my colleagues and I want, the, want it to be heard that this, this notion of um, making assumptions about what you think someone's talking about when maybe you're not, you're not actually sure is, is worth asking about and listening, uh, listening to more. Yeah, yeah I, there are now all I, kinds I of acute questions in the Q&A that I will not be able to answer. So I'm just going to get at one that I think is related to, Kate, uh, your comments about listening to learners. 
And the question is, how do we get students, perhaps students who have been marginalized in their literacy development um, by their by their um, uh, their previous experiences, but how do we get them to own these practices? Like the, the um, both the skills and the sort of broader uh, tool of literacy. Like, how do we help them own it? It's a great question, I think. Yeah, I. So it's a great, it's a big question. So maybe mm -hmm. one one thought on it. Um, I think it's really important that we like in when we think about reading instruction, literacy instruction across all ages, but particularly for older readers, um, that we help them to see purpose in what they're doing, that it's not decontextualized from what they care about and the things they're thinking about. I mean, ultimately the purpose of literacy should be, I think we would all agree is to um, read, to be able to read in order to critique text, take action in the world, change the world. Um, and I think sometimes that, that connection isn't as clear um, in contexts where um, where students don't have an opportunity to see how those things relate to um, what they care about um, and what they want to do as people and the relationships they want to have. And so I think um, that authenticity and and that sort of purposeful engagement in literacy is really important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for your candor and um, what you've shared today. There are a couple of comments. One. Uh, about the importance of libraries again, and that um, you know there is a market for literacy materials, and we should not forget that people make money off of this, and that um, sometimes the money making component of this becomes more important than the actual outcomes, um, and we don't want to forget that um, because I think that can actually be a, a de detriment to what we're trying to achieve. There's also a question from the uh, chair of our uh, Dean's Advisory Board here at Wheelock, which I think is a particularly important challenge to the two of you. And that is, how do the programs that you're engaged with and the work you're doing interact with our leadership preparation programs? So that our the people we're preparing to be school leaders are also going into schools and enabled to do better work in terms of leading uh, groups of teachers. Does anyone want to say anything about that? Otherwise, I'll, because I don't know if we're, I, I, personally, I don't know if we're doing any intersection there, but um, it's a great idea. So one thing I'll just say is um, we have a, a reading specialist program that, you know, a reading specialist, like it is a, a type of leadership role, um, ideally. Um, but I also say that that question prompts me to think, you know, we've been trying to be really interdisciplinary in in our thinking in our college about how to approach literacy, but um, maybe we need to be even more expansive in how we're thinking about that in terms of engaging um, even more programs and departments to really think about that as a sort of a college-wide approach, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah. There's a question in here that I'm not gonna be able to get to from Andrew that uh, we're gonna take down because it could be its own webinar focusing on multiple literacies, Digital literacy, which we, uh, you know, we have expertise that we, we lock on. Um, so, Andrew, stay tuned. We may, we may actually take your question and turn it into its own webinar. I want to, um, because in the interest of time, I want to thank you, Kate and Nancy, and all of our participants for joining us today. As I mentioned at the outset, um, this webinar, like all the others, will be on our YouTube channel. If you go into YouTube and Google or whatever you do, search for BU Wheelock. Um, we want to make sure you're able to share this and other uh, other uh, webinars with colleagues and friends. Um, I want to uh, encourage you to uh, highlight other ways in which you might get involved. Um, my colleague Megan Combe has been dropping things in the chat that have resources available, but I also want to be sure that you know that there are um, there are connections to um, the National Center for Improving Literacy, um, as well as to our college um, programs. If you have an interest in pursuing a degree in, in uh, um, either elementary or early childhood or special education or um, our reading education program, we would certainly love to talk to you about those opportunities. Um, and then I also want to tell you that um, there's a, a QR code that we're putting on, on screen about um, future webinars. Um, I'm excited for one coming up in mid-February focused on um, uh, featuring my colleague Edson Filio and the psychology of excellence. 
Um, and this is really about excellence in every kind of uh, field and work. Like how do you think about thriving uh, in, in, uh, in the work that you do? And we would love to have you join us um, for that webinar as well. So again, um, Kate, Nancy, thank you. I wanna thank uh, Mary Ellen Medallo and Megan Combe for being fantastic facilitators of this process. And wanna thank everyone who joined us today. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.